Hello, my darlings. I'm Saren Breyer, and welcome to Bite Notes, the recap show for the Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle ATL by Night. Tonight, we look back at Season 2, Chapters 7 and 8. Now, let's sit back, relax, and recap a vampire story. Chapter 7, Traitor to the Shadow. Anton, Mel, and Thomasina follow Aaron's gurney as it's rolled through the halls, tracking him to his cell. From the vents, they can see eight cells in total, each one containing someone. Melisande finds a scrap of fabric looped through the vent above Aaron's cell. Anton touches it, growing extremely hungry as he employs some of his blood sorcery. The last person to handle the fabric was named Caroline. She was a human, maybe, and she hanged herself. Outside the facility, Cirrus has watched the rest of his coterie enter the building through the scope of his sniper rifle. Going silent and invisible, he follows them in and uses the vents to reach the security office. A single guard is watching the cameras. Cirrus settles in and waits. The others continue their reconnaissance, passing over Alejandro Salinofoto's room. If he is a prisoner here, this is a very nice jail cell, full of plush furnishings and art, with an opera playing from a phonograph. In his cell, Aaron slowly wakes up to find his shadow moving of its own accord. He begins to loudly, badly, sing Dolly Parton to comfort himself. In the vents, Anton heightens his senses so he can hear it better. I'm gonna kill him. And then turn out the lights. And then you can sleep. She shakes her head slowly. So he just can't, he's gotta stop. gotta stop and I'll I'll switch from Tilly radio to Anton FM (laughs) and uh, start singing some Dolly Parton (laughs) specifically the here you come again (laughs) and just keep looking at the door are you singing this particularly loud Uh, yeah is loud enough as I usually do. I know they're still recording me. Okay. You guys can hear faint echoes through the air vents of Aaron singing. Kind of intermingling with whatever's on the phonograph. Yeah. I'm going to turn on heightened senses just to pick it up a bit more. Yeah, you can hear them. And I'll just lie back, still watching the shadow a little bit, and just trying to think out what just happened to me. I'm gonna start melting along. <laughs> Anton and Cirrus both use their heightened senses to whisper a plan to one another. Cirrus orders the others to get to Aaron while he opens the door. He instructs them to go out the front. Cirrus drops down into the security office, cleanly blowing the guards' brains out as he does. He shoves some of the guards' flesh into his mouth and presses the button that unlocks all the cell doors. Alarms start blaring, and Mel dropkicks a vent falling into the hallway. She and Thomasina run to Aaron while Anton goes to open all the other doors, and then it goes dark. Oppressively dark. It's almost painful, and they feel themselves rising off the ground, unable to move. Cirrus, who was heading for Alejandro's room, is caught in it too. A voice travels smoothly through the shadow. Alejandro Celino Foto. Aaron is able to see him through the darkness. Alejandro offers that they too could live in safety and luxury if they join him here. He knows all of their names and knows too many things about them. 
the shepherds refuse his offer and eventually he says goodbye, leaving them to the soldiers. Melisande continues dragging Aaron towards the exit, while Anton and Thomasina open the cells. Cyrus buys them some time with the soldiers, taking out all but one in the first wave, but getting hit with an incendiary round in the process. As the others reach the front door, two trucks pull up outside and open fire. Aaron manages to cloak himself a bit with his shadow, and he, Mel, and Thomasina make a break for it, while Anton turns back to help Cyrus. Cyrus yells at Anton to go, but he refuses. Outside, Melisanda attacks the two guards at the gate, ripping them to pieces. Thomasina has to pull her off as Aaron lays down cover fire and they sprint for the car. Cyrus slips back up into the vents and it goes dark for Anton again. The shadow wraps around him and he is thrown from the building as his coterie comes speeding around the corner. The shepherds are hungry, bloody, and hurt, but they've all managed to escape. In the woods outside the facility, Cyrus systematically hunts down all the people Alejandro embraced, eats their hearts, and burns their bodies. As Scourge of Atlanta, this is his right. Once home, Anton tries to sate some of his hunger, but thanks to an earlier Blood of Potency ritual, the bagged blood doesn't do enough. In the midst of this, Cyrus walks in the front door, drenched in blood and visibly hurt. They all gather in the lowest level of the basement to talk. Cyrus lectures them on their carelessness in getting discovered by the Second Inquisition in the first place. Aaron's blood dealer was working for them, and Anton and Thomasina were made at the subsequent wellness check by the police. Given Anton's hunger, it's decided that he should be staked until they're able to get him something to eat. He and Cyrus both get into coffins to rest, Cyrus with a gun in his hand. Thomasina and Melisanda ask Hex to destroy their former lives for them. Hex promises Thomasina that she'll make sure Philip is taken care of too. Aaron thanks the girls for coming to get him. He doesn't want to be in a box for a while, so he lays down on the floor to sleep. Before sunrise, Cirrus opens up just a little. There we go. Okay. Uh, before they walk away, mm -hmm. um, Cirrus actually is going <laughs> to sit up. Um, Ooh. <clears throat> Ooh. I don't know how to act around people. Yeah. I have been alone my entire existence. It is all I've ever known. I do not know what my life was before I was embraced. I have only known how to hunt and kill. It is the only job I do. As I said, I did what was necessary tonight. And I would do it again, no matter what. And I'm going to, as I'm walking with him to wherever we're going, just very, like, quietly and kind of softly and kind of sillily say, We love you too, Cirrus. <laughs> and just kind of patter to where we were going. <laughs> um, and, uh... There is a knife embedded in the wall next to your head. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to take that knife <laughs> just a little. I'll say, give it back to you tomorrow. <laughs> I'll stick it in my boot. Progress. It's not bullets. It's good. <laughs> this is good. Yeah. Chapter 8. Take it off. A few weeks later, the Coterie has all been healed and fed, and even their mansion has undergone some renovations. 
They have received a letter from Mooney inviting them all to the Violet Sin nightclub for Talbot Rourke's execution, with a note to dress appropriately. Cyrus won't be attending. The Coterie hasn't seen him since Aaron's rescue. Aaron has used his newfound ghost sight around the house and discovered two ghosts that hang around the mansion and the barn. Melisanda has also introduced him to his horse, Famine. In one of the carriage houses, they find a black classic Mustang with an envelope addressed to Cirrus tucked under the windshield wiper. It looks as though Cirrus has been given his own horse in a way. Upon their arrival at Violet Sin, the bouncer marks the back of their hands with a V. The club is lit with black light, neon on every person and surface. They are the only vampires here. Everyone else is Garu. They hang out and party for a while, enjoying the opportunity to relax a bit. Eren catches glimpses of Sonny, but she's clearly avoiding him. Anton gets cornered by a short, energetic Garu named Slaughter, who has about a million questions about vampires. Can I help you? And she, as she comes up to you, you see she is maybe four foot ten. She is extremely short, uh, but she's making up for it in posture. She's just very short. As she approaches that, I notice that I go, can I help you, miss? <laughs> she goes, hey, I'm Slaughter. Anton, it's a pleasure to meet you. Oh my god, I have so many questions for you. Like, okay, so like, are you really dead? I'm sorry? Are you really dead? Like, is that like your whole thing, like you're dead? It's a state of being, I suppose. It's Oh my god. Medically, yes. So like you're dead when like the sun's out? Like, do you dream? Is that like sleeping? Like, do you dream? Funny you should ask, I had quite a few recently, as it were. Why do your teeth look normal right now? I would like them to. Can you drink any... Can you drink any kind of blood? Or is there like weird special blood you have to drink? I... It varies. Me personally, I've got a uh, strong stomach. I've never quite been sure. Do different it. blood types taste different? Like, do you have a favorite? I'm gonna AD, like. AD I'm, positive. Actually. I'm gonna go straight for him. <laughs> yeah. Be like, hey, Anton, how how are how's things going? How's so if it you're going? dead, do you do things like? I'm sorry, I didn't meet you. What was Hi, your name? my name's Slaughter. What's yours? Uh, I'm I'm Mel. It's nice to meet you, Anton. Can I speak to you? Are you guys different for a second? Like, Just I for a second. Just kinds. right over here. <laughs> we'll come back to this, and I'll just okay. follow, I'll follow over. After about an hour, Dot, Falcon, and Alpha enter the club with a golden casket in tow. They and Mooney enter a back room, while two Garu guard it. Meanwhile, Thomasina dances and flirts with a tall, tattooed woman named Tank. Eventually, she goes to find Anton. She confides in him that she felt particularly useless during Aaron's rescue, and proposes that she and Anton teach each other some new abilities. Doing that would involve drinking directly from one another, and it's typically a bit taboo. I, uh... I felt... pretty without when we were trying to get Aaron. Um, and I... I don't know if there is... anything that I could offer in return. I'm sorry, are you asking what I think you I are? I... don't have to. No, I'm just very curious. Mm -hmm. uh, she's uh, typically a taboo topic. Typically, we, we, we would be surrounded by our own. We aren't right now. Suppose an arrangement could be made. Such as? We are, uh, we are, as I, as we have learned, two very different kindred with, uh, very different backgrounds and fortes. Mm. You are also an educator, yeah? Perhaps we could learn from each other. Mm -hmm. 
and as it as it sits i am i woke up not uh, as refreshed as typical i know the feeling Enzhan has one stipulation he is not allowed to teach anyone blood sorcery thomasina agrees to that and they find a private booth dot falcon and alpha emerge from the back room and sit in a VIP booth of their own. Melisanda and Aaron go to talk to them, and are informed that one of the shepherds will have to complete Talbot's execution. Dot provides a 17th century sword for the task. Aaron and Mel find Anton and Thomasina, and Anton volunteers to be the one to execute Talbot. Mooney announces that it's time. Her bodyguards bring out the golden casket and unceremoniously dump Talbot's body onto the dance floor. Falcon's wooden hairpin still in his chest. Mooney approaches the body, knots her hand in his hair, and lifts him. Anton hefts the sword and in one strike severs Talbot's head from his body. It turns to ash as it falls. Alpha collects some of the ash into two jars, handing one to Mooney and one to Dot. The DJ turns up the music, and the Garu dance upon the ashes of Prince Talbot Rourke. The missing primogen emerge from the back room, all wearing neon outfits that glow in the black light. Olivia Grace looks particularly furious about the dress code, but the Primogen Council of Atlanta has returned. Mooney beckons the shepherds up to her VIP booth and presents them all with the revised peace treaty she created with the Primogen. As of tonight, the Kindred and the Garu have an accord. As part of this, they agreed to keep an eye on each other's respective hunters. The Second Inquisition for Kindred and a company named Pentex for the Garu. It becomes painfully clear to Mooney that none of the shepherds really know anything about Garu, so she explains that they are born, not made. It's more like a genetic predisposition, the first change happening at some point in their lives. Mooney's first change was a little later on, and she has a son in the Glasswalker tribe. The shepherds try to honor their decision not to tell Mooney that they know about her former life, but they aren't very good at talking around an issue. Besides, Mooney already knows where they're living as part of her agreement with the Primogen. The house clearly holds a lot of pain and trauma for her, and she asks the shepherds to destroy as much of its personal effects as they can. During this discussion, Aaron notices that the club is getting darker than the others see it. Mooney yells at her bodyguards to turn on the lights, but they're snuffed out as soon as they go on. The darkness is growing, and Aaron can't find its source. Mooney yells at everyone to run, and the inhabitants of the club scatter. After making a few loops in the car to make sure they weren't followed, the shepherds arrive home. Mooney is waiting for them on the front porch. She hands Mel an envelope that was on her windshield when they ran. The note inside reads in scratch, the language of the Garu, there will be no peace. Thank you for tuning in to Bite Notes. Remember, liking, commenting, and subscribing does not violate the masquerade. You can view full episodes of ATL by Night on our YouTube channel. We stream Tuesdays at twitch.tv slash ATL by Night. Remember to support us on Patreon and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, good night.